love hanging out with you. <laughs> you ready? Yep. Welcome back to the hold on. <laughs> <That's so weird>. <coughs> 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 I'm just gonna do this again. It's like <laughs> you ready? Yeah. <clears throat> Because man's task is to make the earth after the model of heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Man's project is to heavenize the earth. Man is made to transform the world from glory to glory. To take hold of it and break it down and remake it after the image of heaven. Welcome back to the Reformed Reset. My name is Grant, and joined with me is my beautiful wife, Erica, the weaker vessel. Hello, everyone. On this episode of the Reformed Reset, we are going to talk about cessationism versus continuationism. So, if you would, please, before we get started, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Take Old Studios, like the video. If you're listening in podcast world, ensure that you subscribe to the podcast. Leave us a five-star review and, you know, leave a comment down in the comment section because we know that we're not going to cover all the bases. We're going to try. Much ink has already been spilled, so... But, you know, everyone's got their own little experience or take on these things, so make sure you share your thoughts. In the description below is a link to our Patreon, our merch store, and our social media. You can look up Erica Van Brimmer or Grant Van Brimmer on social media as well. Follow us, send us a message. Um, we'd love to connect with you. Takeholdstudios at gmail.com. You can write us an email if you have questions or, you know, whatever. So anyway, go check all that out in the description below. We appreciate it. And I think that's it as far as all that stuff goes. That's enough of the business. That's enough of the business. <laughs> Facts. All right, guys. Well, this is a fun. This is a fun topic. I actually think I don't know if we've covered a doctrine I don't in a while. Think, well, I don't think we've ever talked about this one, have we? No. Have we ever talked about this topic? No. I, in five years of doing this. Yeah, I don't think so. I know. I don't. Think we've so had either. we've had to have at least mentioned it in passing. Sure. Maybe. Yeah. You know, but no, we actually used to cover doctrines a lot more in the past. Like well, we do episodes on, on doctrinal yeah. stuff. Yeah. So we, we were just talking the other day. We've been doing this for almost five years now and yeah. our theology has changed along the way. And I think it might be time for us to kind of revisit some of the things that we talked right. about to begin with. Yeah. If, if not just to be more precise than we were. But those though that content's yeah. also not available to the internet. It's thank to God, anyone right? anymore. Um, and yeah, probably praise be to God. <laughs> um yeah. yeah. I'd have to go back in the archives and see what we did talk about, you know? I don't know. I don't remember all of it, but I do remember going through Christ as priest, king, prophet at one point too. Yeah, I think remember I doing think that. We, now we could do that from a James Jordan. He kind of yeah, which we actually had done that recently. Actually, that right? was yeah. to some degree. It was it's fuller now. You know, it's not like we changed our okay. view, but it's fuller now. Sure. I think we did something like that. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. So, all right. Well, we got a. This is a listener question. Yeah, right, we're gonna sh we're gonna shout her out again. Of course, we need to. She's our biggest fan. It's true. We should make her a T-shirt that says "Biggest Fan." We should. That should go into the. I feel like you shouldn't make a shirt like that for a woman, though, because "Biggest Fan" could almost be an insult for a woman, right? Most, mostest fan. You are the <laughs> greatest fan. There you go. Yeah, that, that's fine. Greatest fan. Yeah. No comment. No words of largeness. No stature, because she's not. No stature. Sure. She's not a large lady, so she doesn't need that. But wow, Rachel, I'm really sorry. Rachel Perfetta, you are a beloved listener. You are. You're much loved. Much. <laughs> oh, how much worse could we make? You are it? a lovely lady, Rachel. Don't listen to anything we're saying. This do be facts. 
This do be facts. This do be. You guys, we're off the rails and we haven't even got started <laughs> that yet. Do, what is, no, what is that? That do be the facts, though? Is that like, <laughs> that do be facts? Have you seen that comment on stuff? No. It's a joke. It's not sincere. It's, you know, it's just oh, trying to be. I thought you were making fun of Cassandra. No. You know, you know. <laughs> okay. So. All the people here hopefully are all laughing. Everyone else is like, why can't they just start talking about tongues, <clears throat> tongues and stuff? <laughs> So listen, we're gonna start talking about tongues and stuff. <laughs> okay. If you what is a continuationist? Can you can you explain that to me? Yep, a continuationist believes that the revelatory slash sign gifts that are talked about in the New Testament, in particular, speaking in tongues uh, prophecy. and prophecy, mm-hmm. are still in operation just the same as they were in the early church the Mm -hmm. apostolic era today would they call it the apostolic era or would they still see it probably not yeah okay probably not so new testament or uh, early church era yeah like infant infant church brand new church baby church book of acts right they're not big church they're baby (laughs) they're baby they're not large church they're little church (laughs) Okay. They're schmedium. Um, so then what is cessationism? So that that comes from the word to cease, right? So cessationist is one who believes that those revelatory gifts have ceased. Mm-hmm. All right. And I am emphasizing revelatory on purpose because I think that's the, the key in this discussion. So explain what you mean by revelatory gifts. So by the distinction. Right. Christ ushered in the new covenant. Okay. Okay. No one can disagree on that. Right. Um, he, you know, at Lord's Supper, when you, when you come to the Lord's table, Jesus proclaimed this blood is the new covenant, right? Mm -hmm. This is the new, um, new covenant, my blood. Um, and then the Holy Spirit, he ascends, the Holy Spirit's poured out. There's a whole, there's a whole sequence of events of the ministry of Christ to include the judgment on Israel Mm -hmm. uh, in AD 70, right? Mm -hmm. So we have the conclusion in AD 70 of of a covenant era Mm -hmm. and a new covenant has been ushered in. So would you say that being partial preterist is sort of a key to being cessationist? At least to some degree. Okay. Um, Maybe you're not partial preterist in your in your eschatology, but you I think it's really important to recognize that God has, um, that there were two eras overlapping and right. Like we have Paul going to the temple and making vows and stuff. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. Right. Are we missing something? Right. But it's because he was in an overlapping period. Right. And so when you understand that, then you look at what Paul did and you go, Oh, well, okay. I I get it. Yeah. You know, um, the book of Hebrews Mm -hmm. When it talks about, you know, our pastor just preached on this last Sunday, how there are things that um, when when the world, when everything's shaken, Mm. it falls away. But the things that are to remain stay. Mm -hmm. Right. So there are certain things that fell away when that world was shaken and the new covenant, um, the new covenant era was um, left after 80 70 and all that kind of stuff okay all that's really helpful i mean it it, at least for us right the more we've looked into it and studied it it makes um a lot of passages uh make sense yep for us so anyway continuationist believes all that everything the new testament talked about continues today cessationist believes that they realize certain things have ceased yeah when um the after 80 70 the canons closed canon meaning the scriptures right there's no new revelation there's no new scripture being written yes and um and once that once that happens then certain things ceased we didn't need them anymore right so so we're cessationist and i will read this real quick because it just helps place the context and i think first corinthians 12 to 14 paul obviously is addressing the church in corinth it applies to the church in general, um, first Corinthians 12, he talks about the, the gifts of the spirit and it's, 
many more than just revelatory gifts. It's the gift of helps, the gift mm-hmm. of administration. administration. Yeah. Bunch of stuff, right? Um, they're dispensed according to the will of the spirit, mm-hmm. not the person. Mm-hmm. That's helpful. Thinking, you know, addressing charismatic yeah. people. You can't just turn them on and whatever, right? The spirit yeah. is the one who decides who gets what gift um, and for how long they mm-hmm. get that gift. Um, and then uh, Paul goes into um, how love kind of supersedes all of these things. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the greatest of these is love. Yeah. And it's kind of, it seems like it's out of nowhere, but... Um, um, but Paul, you know, wants to make sure that they're grounded in what is going to remain forever. Mm-hmm. That remains forever. And he, then he says, because we, we actually only prophesy in part here and mm-hmm. I'll just read it. This is first Corinthians 13 verse, um, nine for we know in part, cause that was a gift too, mm-hmm. the gift of knowledge for we know in part and we prophesy in part. We just listened to a podcast and they were saying, you know, how is it that I know more than Paul? That's ludicrous. It's like, seriously? Like, there's probably several letters that we have that Paul wasn't sitting around reading because it was all still being written. So, of course, we know more. And we have the whole canon. He didn't have the whole canon. Just because he's an apostle and God has uh, used him to, um, to write scripture. And remember... We don't believe in inspired people. Mm-hmm. We believe the Holy Spirit inspired, you know, uh, th- them to write certain things. Right. But it's not like everything Paul touched was gold. Right. Yeah. Like he, like his to do list wasn't was no inspired. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. His to do list wasn't inspired. Mm-hmm. Um, so we got to remember that. We know in part. We prophesy in part. First Corinthians thirteen ten, but. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Mm -hmm. The most common interpretation that I've heard throughout the years was that, well, the perfect is Christ, right? So when the perfect is come, that's what it's talking about. So these gifts that are in part are going to remain until Christ comes back. Mm -hmm. That's what I used to always hear. Um, Two things I think refute that. One is that the the perfect here is in the neuter in the Greek. Mm. Okay? Um, so you have masculine, feminine, and neuter. Christ is never referred to as neuter. Right. Any reference to Christ is going to be masculine. Right. And so that doesn't make sense. And that's right. an easy, like, Paul. Paul's not dumb. Right. He might know in part, but yeah. he's not dumb. Yeah. yeah. The second thing is the contrast is with knowledge and prophecy. Right. Right. And so, and again, so this is why I said emphasizing revelatory is important here because the whole purpose of prophesying and tongues was to reveal the word of God. They were revelatory. They revealed the word of well, God. Well, you know that because it even says that tongues are given for the unbelievers, but prophecy for the believers, right? Yes. So there's two categories of people mm-hmm. that scripture would need to go to the believers and the unbelievers. And there's two ways of reaching them. Exactly. So, it makes more sense that what now is perfect is the word of God. Exactly. So we have that in full, which means that which only comes in part is not needed. Right. You don't. So just logically that that makes more sense. Right. That that is what's going away. Right. That's what's going to go away. Mm-hmm. But the word doesn't go away, which is why we still have pastors and teachers. Right. So why don't we need apostles? Why don't we need... Um, well, one, we just couldn't have apostles anymore. Well, that's true, too, because the requirements for an apostle was they've seen the risen Lord. Yeah. That sort of thing. Although if you get into some crazy charismatic circles, they claim those kinds of things, too. Right. And so. that I get friend requests on Facebook all the time, apostle, whatever. And usually it's uh, deny friend requests because <laughs> I don't want I don't want that. <laughs> um, exactly. And you, you'll see that uh, depending on where you are in the country. You don't see too much up here in Maine, but I remember no, in the South. Everywhere. Yeah. Apostle, Apostle this, Evangeline. Kimberly. Yeah. Apostle yeah. Jessica, hear the yeah. word of the Lord. Yeah. And that's... Get ready for revival. That's terrifying. Thursdays at seven. I hope they're all writing down what she said because it's the word of God. They need to obey it. Okay. So we're getting a little catty here, but... Yeah. Um, but one of the one of the other passages that charismatics point to 
is Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 4. Okay, let's stop real quick. We use the term charismatic. Can you define that for us real quick? Okay. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Charismatic, the word comes from uh, charisma. It just means like gifts that we've been given. Um, and so charismatic has typically been a term used for churches or the movement that focuses on exercising these revelatory gifts. So they would all be continuationists that exercise these gifts and yes. they do it in sometimes uh elaborate fashion yeah so there? yeah so <clears throat> let's see all charismatics are continuationists but all continuationists are, are not, not charismatic. charismatic yeah because there would be and we want to be fair about this too we right. are definitely not um continuationists but we do believe that there are continuationists who love jesus and uh, and preach the word of god and have an emphasis on the word and are of god right, and can be right about most other things right just this one particular doctrine they're off on right exactly um there's a lot of good even you know uh more so reformed pastors authors whatever that are continuationists but that part of their doctrine doesn't dominate mm. their ministry and so okay. in that way you that's would, fine you can right. benefit a yeah. lot from them or whatever yeah. whereas charismatics the the spirit is really what they focus on mm -hmm. and this is and I, we speak in generalities we can't qualify to death right but charismatics it's it's really we got to really focus on the the spirit and the work of the spirit here and, and for so. a lot of charismatics they would even say something says so, so extreme as you're not saved unless you speak in tongues no right? that's yeah it's like a sign of your salvation and the, there's some pretty crazy stuff that can go on in those circles so yeah which is straight up turning a a descriptive passage into a not even just prescriptive but they they look at it's like ultimate I, I don't even know how you get there because even if you were to take all of what paul said as applying to your life today you still could never get that that's the proof of your salvation well, I feel bad for the thief on the cross. Maybe he did. I mean, speaking, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't know. Um, well, the other problem with tongues, we, we, I don't know how much you want to get into just tongues itself, but uh, gibberish versus known language, right? Like we yeah. hold, it's a known language. It's meant to preach the gospel. Um, it's not, it's not for gibberish. It's not gibberish. That just right. doesn't make any sense. Right. We could get into like what a proper... Uh, usage of all those would be prophecy tongues. We don't believe that they're done today, so it, it seems sort of irrelevant to even talk about that. Um, but one question I want to ask you, because this seems to be a thing that we are asked a lot. That's our cat, sorry. Uh, a, a lot is, are you saying that God can't do miracles then? Right. Then you, how can you not believe in miracles? You're basically limiting God. You're putting God in a box. Right, you're putting the spirit in a box. Well, I would I would first say Paul did that first so blame him not me because most charismatic churches you see there's no structure in order mm. and in 1 Corinthians 14 Paul specifically says like if somebody has a tongue you have to have an interpreter mm -hmm. oh no boundaries right right so I'm mean, like Paul already did that and then the, he did the same thing with prophecies he said like no more than three and then that's it what mm. well what if the spirit's leading five people right. Paul and then but then paul goes on and says because god is a god of order right right so do everything um orderly mm -hmm. so uh, there is structure god is yeah. not a chaotic god and doesn't make sense and it's there's no boundaries or limits or structure and order um so get that uh, get that into your yeah. head first yeah. and then um we have we've always said like no the the spirit again the spirit chooses the spirit is the one um who decides what he's going to do and how he's yeah. going to work in the world <clears throat> so if he wants to um heal somebody he will right if there is a tribe somewhere that is not really you it's hard to communicate and somehow missionaries are able to communicate yeah. somehow whether it's that speaking their language or somehow just the spirit opens the ears and they're able to hear he'll do that then right. there's a lot of stories of that happening right there's a lot of st uh, stories of when <clears throat> the gospel first breaks into a tribe or nation or something and 
that happens the the tongue thing happens in some weird way they can't explain it mm -hmm. um limbs grow back or what sure. like there's all kinds of accounts of this yeah so you have to just say oh they're all just lying but right. i mean it or you can just believe that the spirit does this and we believe that that god is outside of creation and outside of time and steps into creation and does stuff all the time right that's why we, we pray and we ask god for miracles we literally yeah. ask him in our cessationist church every sunday to do miracles we ask him right. to heal every like literally every sunday so how can you say you're a cessationist but then you also say well i still believe in the gift of healing or the gift of tongues doesn't that seem kind of contradictory well no i know i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> i don't think it is at all because for me the the scriptures say that the spirit is the one who is giving these gifts anyway so to me i never i never understood the the claim that somebody is a healer mm -hmm. right i was like no the spirit wills mm -hmm. who gets these gifts right i'm not just like a healer and so now you can walk into the children's hospital and just start right if there is like if benny hen's a healer why is he not visiting hospitals stop having big you know uh mm. arena meetings and go into the hospitals if you have right. the gift of healing right and isn't it curious that paul is able to raise someone from the dead but then he has to tell timothy drink some wine right why well, stomach because your stomach's upset i think well two things the holy spirit is the one who's deciding when that happens anyway mm -hmm. but also timothy said or paul said that to timothy in i believe second timothy which would have been in 60s ad right before he died or at least closer to his mm -hmm. death in the mid late 60s and that's really close to that era being over so the so gifts were probably fading out fading away so what you're saying is um is that this would have been considered speaking in tongues and prophecy especially would have been considered normative and expected Mm -hmm. in in that age of history right and then as that faded out as that age was closing it became less and less normative and right. today it's virtually non-existent though the lord can still miraculously do something like that yes right but it's not a thing that we should be expecting in our or, or practicing in our worship services right and and today there are no capital a apostles mm -hmm. who literally write the word of god or thus saith the lord anymore there's just right. that just doesn't exist is there a distinction to be made of like what's done <clears throat> in a worship service over and above what's done as like a missionary or uh, on a missions trip like are those two different things in your mind too like calling people up on stage to do healings or whatever mm -hmm. versus you are in the middle of uganda and someone gets attacked by you know an animal or whatever and you're all gonna like pray over that person would those be two different scenarios in your head altogether um kind of because uh in scripture we're given how to worship god mm -hmm. and i don't think doing that sort of random healing like in like impromptu sort of stuff is mm -hmm. not part of that um there's no benny hen like let me touch your forehead and right you are suddenly or I, cured of i know someone is hurting today yeah, yeah. right i know someone's hurting today um and you're you're afraid to come well duh everyone's hurting and afraid to come up because mm -hmm. you're acting weird um <laughs> but but uh we're supposed to always be praying for one another so that should be happening all the time right. you know what i mean i i'm sure a lot of you listening do that you're on the phone with someone and they're they're sharing something difficult and you're like can i pray with you now yeah yeah let's do it and you pray for them or if they're or if you're with with them <clears throat> you say can i pray for you right now and you lay your hands on them right and you pray for them but in paul's instructions it's it is laying out how a worship service ought to be ordered right right what, like there has to be interpreter present there has to be no more mm -hmm. th there's a there are parameters Clear guidelines as how like how this should be done in a worship service right. and what we're saying is yeah that shouldn't be done in a worship service anymore right there's there's no like prophecy it, it, and this is where like you you uh some people misinterpret even how paul's using prophecy in first corinthians in particular chapter 11 mm. and it, there was a specific revelatory function 
of the gift of prophecy during this era, during this new early church apostolic, is what we call it, apostolic era, mm-hmm. that doesn't function the same now. Right. We wouldn't do that anymore. Right. And I wouldn't consider a a sermon to be prophecy. Right. It might be like the general like forth telling, right? You're just mm. publicly declaring the word of God. Sure. That's not what the gift of prophecy was. That was foretelling. That was authoritative, mm-hmm. similar to the prophets, right. Elijah and Elisha back in the old covenant. And and here's a another like connection with the whole Bible, which I love doing because biblical theology rocks. But when Israel was in the desert, it was 40 years of testing before they entered into uh, the land Mm -hmm. and uh, the early church era from when Jesus was crucified and ascended about AD 30 until the Jews were judged in AD 70, another 40 year testing Mm -hmm. period. Well, what was characteristic during their time in the desert? Literally bread coming out of the sky every morning, Mm -hmm. water coming out of the rock, snakes being put up on a post and people being healed Mm -hmm. and uh quail flying in from who knows where and just right. dropping in the can miracles right and moses the prophet laying down the word of god for the people mm-hmm. if you read joshua as soon as they enter the land this 40 years are done the manna stops right manna stops joshua uh gets his own copy of the law and he leads them in and said it's the same thing that happened in the new testament church yeah, the transfer of the ages the mir- the revelatory miracles and all that stuff stops and you transfer and you- what it is is you actually mature it's better yeah it's we're not losing anything well and that's the thing that i i love so much is that it is better mm-hmm. it's better for us to have it written down and like we can read it whenever we want we can share it with different people in different languages isn't that better than just hoping that the holy spirit falls on you and you can share scripture with someone in a different language or right. yeah. just asking this you know the spirit to fall on you so that you can like maybe share a word from the lord with people like mm-hmm. I, it is better right you have, have access to all of it right now we have what a dozen bibles in, literally in, to the right of us right now. <laughs> different translations in our home in that era there was a bible every other city one or yeah, you know, I, well, eventually it wasn't it even wasn't, done yet, but yeah, I, mm-hmm. but like for sorry, but I, I mean the canon even wasn't um, solidified until technically right. three twenty five. Like we get to read all of Paul's letters. No one else at that time we probably could, got yeah. to read all of Paul's letters. Yeah, there's a um, there's a cool book, and it's like a it's like a historical fiction, so it's based on all historical stuff. Mm-hmm. But it was but they added you know fictional details to mm-hmm. it. I think it's called letters from pergamum or something like that mm-hmm. <clears throat> i can't remember i let someone borrow it was really fascinating i took it in seminary i read that i had to read it in seminary but but it it made you realize in this era of the church um way before the printing press and stuff uh, people just don't have bibles in their home so think about going to church on sunday and you you met at the rich guy's house because he probably had the most space and he likely had a library mm-hmm. and he might have been able to fund a copy of and in the book i think what it what it is is a copy of luke mm-hmm. they didn't have everything we're talking ad 100 or whatever <clears throat> but they just have luke mm-hmm. so you imagine being at a church that just all they do is read luke right because that's all you you have the old testament and then you have luke yeah and then you know, you get word like, oh, guys, um, so this guy is coming through. Um, he, he wrote us a letter and he's going to be bringing uh, Colossians with him. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I haven't I've never heard that one. But yeah. we know that Paul was an apostle and he wrote this letter. We're blessed. So blessed now on this side of things. We didn't lose anything great. And boy, I wish we could have that back. God, God matured his church. Right. Um, into the era that we're in now. The so. funny thing is, is that this is always a temptation in the church is to want the shadow over the substance. We yes. really like, I don't know why that <laughs> is, but isn't that what the Israelites did too? Like they, they wanted 
the food they had in Egypt. They mm-hmm. wanted they wanted to go back. They was wanted to go back to the thing they thought was better. But it actually what isn't it better to eat from the hand of God and depend on him rather than get food from your slave master? Yeah. Like just who cares how it even tastes? Like one it certainly has to be better than the other. But they always wanted to go back. And I think the church today is still that way. We still value the shadows over and above the substance so mm-hmm. often. And that's why the church is so prone to works-based righteousness. Right. And we want to be infants rather than grow up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of that a lot of this conversation really seems like that to me. Like you yeah. you want to stay in your infancy and isn't that like I mean, people are always chasing miracles. People are always chasing signs. And Jesus said, like, you know, that's all you want from me, basically. Mm -hmm. You want the signs, which I'm standing right in front of you. Right. Yeah. It's really good. Really, really good. All right. What else did we need to... Okay. So are there any other common objections that typically uh, would be hurled at a cessationist? Uh, Okay. Um there was one thing that was brought up when we were listening to some stuff about the sufficiency of scripture Mm. and that was interesting that was sam storms talking wasn't it yeah who is a continuationist and so that there's there's an accusation against continuationists that they don't believe in the sufficiency of scripture i think it's the other way around well okay let me see if I am I making this because then he did counter accuse. Okay, okay. Um, because they because they're saying scripture and prophecies and tongues and all this extra stuff okay. still, and that's where the accusation comes and says, "Well, I guess you don't believe in the sufficiency of scripture because you're wanting." I see where you're going with it this. plus okay. all these other sign gifts, mm-hmm. and I mean a lot of these churches, it's like they they have a worship service and then they just have like have a time for the gifts and they have microphones up front that's how it was in our bible college and you can just come up if you get a word from the lord or whatever um right. but where i think the and so sam storms reversed it and said well the sensationists are just not taking all of scripture seriously so they're the ones that aren't holding to sufficiency of scripture right. I, I don't really think his argument was strong well I, what I he's saying is you would have to do away with whole chapters of scripture explaining how to properly practice the gifts yeah. therefore you can't really believe in the sufficiency of scripture because you have to throw That's portions right. of it away yeah and i said or make it unrelevant to your life today right so in that case you better go out and build a tabernacle or build a temple and go worship the Lord and because that's what we were told to do. Right. I mean, there's a whole lot of chapters in Exodus about building a tabernacle. That we don't think we have to live and you by. Know what there, and you know what there wasn't later in the Bible? A whole bunch of chapters saying, don't build temples and tabernacles anymore. Yeah, where is that? I'm just saying it's the same argument with, uh, like, so the Westminster is, is awesome, right? Um, and it says that you know the bible is clear in, in what it tells us to do for um for our life mm-hmm. and then also we can understand it by good and necessary consequence right there's a lot of things you just read scripture and you realize oh, okay i get what it's saying basically use some common sense right and it's a common sense hermeneutic the apostles did this look at the way the apostles interpreted psalms right why did they pick another apostle peter just looked at a psalm and it said um like have another fill fill his place and peter goes oh we need to replace judas yeah how would he have ever understood like right but the spirit leads us into all truth Mm -hmm. and illuminates scripture for us so we we see scripture then we see how paul's using the word temple and stuff in the new testament we realize ah we're the temple now Mm. and you just put the pieces together by good and necessary consequence Mm -hmm. this is just what makes sense right and so if you realize how things function at the beginning of new covenantal eras as God matures his people, it makes sense that there would be revelatory okay. gifts and miracles and that they would fade away. So then would you say having a covenantal understanding of scripture is really important to understanding like everything? Well, yes. I was trying to figure out how to say that without sounding arrogant. But yes, everything. 
It is vital. And we've talked about covenant theology before, and it is, it, it seems to be the hermeneutical grid, right? That's yeah. how you understand yeah. all of scripture. It's how it makes sense. So we've talked about, um, Otherwise being... you're still crucifying animals or you're still killing animals at a temple right. unless you're covenantal. Right. So being a partial preterist, being covenantal, like we could keep going, yeah. but really like this is why it's so important and why we talk about theology all the time, but why it's so important to have no problem passages, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's so important that all of your theology fit together right. and actually help strengthen each other. Mm -hmm. Because if you're covenantal, if you have an optimistic eschatology, right. if you like all of these things are actually going to come together and inform how you view scripture right. and it all works together. Yep. If you are chopping up bits and pieces, which is what dispensationalism actually is, it chops mm -hmm. up God into different time frames and different yeah. methods and different ways of relating to his people. Like, of course, we're going to get to this thing and be like, so confused. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why wouldn't we be? <laughs> you know, the whole yeah. framework of how we view God is a jumbled up mess anyway. So right. maybe we do need a tongue to help us sort it out. <laughs> right. Yeah, I just, I'll bring up again the revelatory nature of some of those gifts and why Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 9 and 10 would say that we know in part, we prophesy in part, but that when that which comes, right. when, perfect, when the perfect comes, that which is in part will go away. Well, and he even says where there are tongues, they will cease, where there is, and prophecy will cease, yeah. right? Yeah. I, mean, I don't want to misquote that, but those two things specifically are mentioned. Yeah, so he, in prophecy. so he goes on verse 11, when I was a child, I spake as a child. It's funny that we talked about yeah, infancy. infancy, but remember Paul says like, you're still on milk, but you should be growing up. Yeah. Like, but also like in the desert, they were, they were being handed their food. That's what you do with a baby. Mm -hmm. And then when they grow up, you say, go make your own PB and J because yeah. you're, you're more, you don't have to be, go pick the garden. Yeah. Um, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, when I grew up, I could eat steak. Mm -hmm. I put away childish things. I mean, we're just following he the passage ears, here. Let him hear. <laughs> Testify. <laughs> Verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And a lot of people think this is talking about the resurrection, mm -hmm. but Doug Wilson ha actually has a great little section in his commentary on this that shows that, yeah, there's some weight to that argument, but ultimately that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But, okay, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. Mm. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Um, so verse eight was actually um, where it says, charity never fails. Well, so it's love never fails, this whole King James. Mm -hmm. Charity never faileth, <laughs> but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Mm. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Mm. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, and then on and on it goes. So we're looking for this to go away. Right. We certainly don't believe this prophecies in tongues is going to continue on all the way through, you know, forever. Right. So it will cease at some point. I think the perfect is the canon it's it's the, the completed word of, word of god mm -hmm. um for us i think that which that makes more sense i i am going to read this <clears throat> from from doug wilson okay okay page 210 page 210 in partakers of grace a commentary on the first epistle to the corinthians by douglas <laughs> wilson um he says there are two main views concerning that which is perfect is this speaking of the time when the perfect revelation of scripture is complete and the canon is closed? Is this what Paul means by perfect here? Or is it an eschatological statement saying that prophecy, tongues, and the gift of knowledge will fail when the resurrection occurs? All right, so there's the two positions. I would, I would tell you which one it is, except for the fact that I, like the apostle here, know in part. So he's mm, being humble cool. and, yeah, humble and cheeky. <laughs> but... In a remarkable display, but then he does still tell us which one, but in a remarkable display of even handedness, 
I will simply point out that verse 12, face to face, even as I am known, sounds eschatological. And that the discussion of failing gifts in verse 8 sounds like they are already starting to fail. Mm, they're actively fading. And a statement in verse 10 that prophecy will be done away with in heaven seems odd. Mm -hmm. Whoever thought that the spiritual gifts would be operative in the resurrection. Quote, will we need prophets after the Bible is complete? seems like a reasonable and pertinent question. True. Whether we need prophets in the throne room of God seems like an absurdity. True. So, some helpful elucidation. Anyway, it, it just, when you put the whole package together, it makes a lot more sense that right. once the Bible is complete, prophecy is not needed. Right. Um, and the way that he's talking about it sounds like it's, currently failing it's currently mm -hmm. moving away not Cycling just out two thousand three thousand years who knows how long really right so anyway that that's a huge key the covenantal structure of history um is really key to it always struck me as odd when paul was talking about like and if an angel comes to you mm -hmm. and gives you any any special knowledge any special sure. gospel right don't believe him Mm -hmm. But then he's also going to kick the door wide open for further revelations. Right. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me either. Like, if he's literally warning them, an angel of God can come to you. Mm -hmm. Don't believe them. But just Joe from down the street can come into church and give you a word, and that we're just supposed to take yeah. forever as the gospel truth. The other thing that's concerning um, is that throughout church, church history, groups that have uh, arisen who believed in this sort of revelatory gifts have pretty much routinely been um, nuts <laughs> and also declared heretics because of their their beliefs, not just because they think they can speak in tongues or something. Um, I don't want to say they're wrong. I think it was either the Donatists or the Montanists in early church history. One could see how you would get confused. Yeah, I, I can't remember which one. Was. Someone who knows their second century, first century church history better than me uh, can correct me in the comments. But it's one of those. I think it was Montanists. And I believe it was Tertullian who got wrapped up in it later in his life. Tertullian. Yeah, I think it was Tertullian, who was really great for the most part. But then... Maybe it was Jerome. Anyway, I'm mixing up. No, it's got to be Tertullian. It's getting late, y'all. This is how it is. <clears throat> but um, the Reformation, there were uh, little nutty groups that, that did kind of the same thing. And predominantly, the rest of the church was like, yeah, that ain't, that ain't cool. And obviously, right. I know the church history is not infallible. But when the majority of the church has routinely put down a certain type of interpretation. It's something to consider. It's something to consider. Right. That's all. Something to consider, you know? Right. Um, they were also wrong on a lot of stuff, too, though, hence the Reformation, but... Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. This honestly is the most consistent if you are Reformed. If you're not Reformed, then, like, I don't know, it's whatever in my mind, right? I think there's bigger fish to fry if you're not, if you're not Reformed than well, like, gifts in, right now. If you're not Reformed, then you have a lot of other theology that just doesn't make wouldn't, it wouldn't help you get to this place is my right. point. And for us, this was something that we we solidified in our theology way later than than Calvinism. Yeah, true. You know, mm -hmm. so. So, yeah, just, uh, yeah, take a closer look. But once again, this is not exhaustive. I hope this just helps you all understand where we're at, why we're where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, we've been going for almost 45 minutes, and I feel like there's so much more that could be said on this topic but yeah, there's there's probably people who are way more qualified to speak on it than we are anyway you can go listen to them <laughs> yeah so anyway hey let us know if you have further questions or specific questions because we'll do follow up if you guys have yeah uh, we could do a q a that actually could be kind of fun yeah definitely yeah we'd love to do that so anyway but we're gonna cut this before we really start rambling and it's 9 p.m. and we don't function well after 8. Yeah. Yeah, at the latest. So, anyway. Yeah, we're, we gotta be done. <laughs> we started off goofy. We're gonna end goofy. So, that's All just, right. That's true. We did. Bring us home, honey. 
Until next time. <laughs> Make sure you subscribe and like and do all that stuff. Anyway, till next time. <clears throat> Take hold and... What am I saying? This is so... Why? It's not even that late, really. <laughs> Take hold and reorder creation by first reforming your home. Right? This has been the Reformed Reset. <laughs> But on the basis of grace and on the finished work of Jesus Christ, the project is back in force, and the destiny of a new transformed world is assured. I just put the sourdough in the oven too, so I've got like 40 minutes.